Nowadays, we rarely see new concepts, but from the 60s to the 90s concepts were very popular. Car makers and coach builders were going head to head with each other, and in motor shows they were trying to show the next big thing. Lamborghini was no exception from this trend. Despite going bankrupt a number of times, Lamborghini continued to amaze everyone, with some of the best and most interesting concepts of all time. So hello guys and welcome back to another video, and here are the Lambo concepts of the past. I'm not including here the Lamborghini concepts which came under the Audi regime, since they are completely different from the old ones and deserve a video of their own. So guys, before I start the video, I want to say that I'm making these short videos because I'm working on a big story of video, about one of the greatest cars of all time and one of my favorites. I want to make it like a proper documentary, so I have dedicated most of the time to that video, since there's a lot of information to process. Until then, I'm going to make these short videos. The first Lamborghini prototype was presented in 1963, and is the first GT built by Lamborghini. Ferruccio really wanted to destroy Ferrari, so he made sure to hire the best people possible, and to build the best car possible. One of the first people who decided to join Lamborghini was Giotto Bizzarini, which had just left Ferrari after building the 250 GTO. Like most of the GT cars of the time, the 350 GTV was going to use a V12 engine. But this was the part when Ferruccio and Giotto decided to go their own ways. The reason for this was that Ferruccio was looking for a grand touring sports car, and not for a high performance race car. When they tested the V12 engine, the power was at 350 horsepowers at 8000 rpm, which was close to the 400 horsepowers at 11000 rpm, which was the goal of Pizzarini. But Lamborghini requested to lower the power to 270 horsepowers at 6500 rpm. So after Giotto left to create his own company, Giampaolo Dallara and Paolo Stazzani took over the project. Since the new factory was under construction, Ferruccio contracted other car makers to manufacture some of the parts for his new car. For the design of the car, Ferruccio hired Franco Scaglione which had just left Bertone and had started working independently. When Ferruccio was asked why he chose Scaglione over the other designers of the time, he said, Well, in the early 60s there were quite a number of designers and stylists to choose from, but Scaglione arrived at my place in a big shiny Mercedes, immaculately dressed and accompanied by a breathtakingly beautiful secretary. Your car will be ready in a week, he told me, so I gave him the job. But if you want to know more about Scaglione, I suggest to watch my video about him, with some points from Ferruccio and just a tubular steel frame, Scaglione managed to create a masterpiece. After a lot of intensive hard work, the new car was finally presented on October 29th, 1963, and Santa Agata. Despite having an engine and most of the mechanical parts, the 350 GTV actually couldn't run, since the team didn't have enough time to finish the project. The reaction was mixed. A lot of people liked the car and a lot of people hated it. The debate continued also after the Torino Motor Show, where the car was present. But Ferruccio wasn't satisfied with the design, so he contacted the Carrozzeria Touring to redesign the car. Later, the Gran Turismo Veloce became the 350 GT, which, like the original design, divided the fence into two sides. 
After the production had started and Sata Gata, the Scalione 350 GTV was left outside the factory building, since there was no space inside. A lot of people were interested to buy the car, but Lambo refused these offers, despite being in big financial troubles. Finally, the car left the factory in 1985, when it was bought by, by two Italian businessmen and car collectors, who bought the car with the premise of restoring it. After four years of hard work, the car was showed in 1990, when it was returned beyond her original condition, since this time the car could run. In 1965, Lamborghini presented the 3500 GTZ, which was designed by Zagato. Despite being a Zagato designed car, the GTZ didn't look as crazy as most of their creations. While I really like the front of this car, Despite being quite generic, I don't know about the rear part. Only two of these cars were ever built by Zagato. One year later, Lamborghini presented the 400 GT Flying Star 2. Like the 3500 GTZ, the car wasn't uh, well received. Personally, I really like this car, probably because I love station wagons and especially shooting brakes. Only one Flying Star was ever built, and the car was sold after the Torino Motor Show. This was the last car designed by Touring, until they returned in the mid-2000s. In 1967, Lamborghini presented probably their most known prototype, Taikoning at the beautiful Marzal. Designed by Marcello Gadini, which designed the Mura for a Lamborghini, the Marzal was built as a four-seater, which would go along the Mura at the 400 GT. The design of this car is just stunning. The glass gallowing doors combined with a silver interior definitely would have offered an amazing driving experience. The car was based on a stretched Mura chassis. The power came from a 2-liter straight, straight 6 engine, which was literally a half Mura V12. Despite the fact that the Bertone was ready to build a Marzal for Lamborghini, Ferruccio cancelled the project since he didn't like the design. In 1974, Lamborghini and Gaddini returned with another amazing project. The Lamborghini Bravo was designed as a replacement for the Uraco and was based on the same mechanics as the Uraco. The design was pure Gaddini of the 70s. The Bravo looked like the child of a Lancia Strato Zero and the Lamborghini Countach. One of the most interesting design choices of the Bravo was the in windscreen and the windows. Bertone had managed to hide the 8-pillar under the windscreen, creating this way a unique look. Also, the rectangular air vents which were located on the front and the rear hood made the car to look even better. The Bravo was a car that could have entered production, but sadly Lambo didn't have the time and the money to create a new car. The Bravo was presented two years after Ferruccio had left the company. At the 1980 Torino Motor Show, at the Lamborghini stand was one of the craziest concepts of all time. The Athon pushed the Lamborghini limits even further. The car was designed by Marc Deschamps, which replaced Marcello Gaddini at Bertone. The design language was quite similar with other concepts of the time like the 1978 Lancia Sibilo and the 1981 Mazda MX-81 Aria. This dystopian future design style was mostly used by Bertone, but there were also some other designers which embraced this style. The Medes continued inside the car, with thick brown leather and with 1980s navigation system. The Athon was based on a Lamborghini silhouette, and like the previous cars, was fully functional. Again, Lamborghini was in big troubles, and uh, later that year they went bankrupt, so there was no chance of building this roadster. While most of this car shared the same design language, since they were all designed by Bertone, mostly Gandini works, this wasn't the case for Marco Polo. Designed by Giorgetto Giugiaro, the Marco Polo was an experimental car, designed for aerodynamic research. Lamborghini had nothing to do with this project, 
but Ital Design decided to bash the car as a Lambo, praying tribute to the innovative style that Lamborghinis always had. The Marco Polo was a very futuristic car for the time and had a style that started appearing on cars only in the mid 90s. The actual prototype wasn't functional, since it was just a clay model. But Ital Design stated that the Marco Polo was meant to be a four seater with two Galwin doors, in similar fashion with a Marzal. Kleiser took over Lamborghini in 1987 and basically changed everything. There's no doubt that this, that this is one of the worst business moves ever done. Like with a Maserati, Kleiser didn't know what actually to do with Lamborghini. Again, like with Maserati, they tried to build uh, cars that would appeal to the American market. And one of these cars was the 1987 Kleiser Lamborghini Portofino. The Portofino was a very strange car. Based on the modified mechanics of the of a Lamborghini Yapla, the car featured a design language which would appear on many production and concepts Chrysler Group cars in the 80s and the 90s. The most unique feature of this car were of course the doors, which gave the Portofino a very futuristic look. Chrysler had no real intention to build this car. The only reason that they built the Portofino was to celebrate the takeover of Lamborghini, something that was shown on the logo of the car, which featured a combination of the Chrysler and Lamborghini logo. The strange Lamborghini concepts continued in 1988, with the introduction of the Genesis. The Genesis would have been the craziest sleeper ever. The minivan was another crazy Bertone creation. The power came from a Lamborghini Countach Quattrovalve V12 with 455 horsepower. Since the engine was so big, Bertone had to mount the front seats literally on top of it. The Genesis had five seats two in the front, one in the middle and two in the rear. If this wasn't enough, Bertone also installed butterfly doors for the front passengers. The Lamborghini Genesis was never meant for production and was just a concept study. With a flop that the LM002 was, Lamborghini had no intention of building another passenger car. But the car that Lamborghini really wanted to build was the P140. The only way that Lambo could have been saved was only if they presented a new baby Lambo, which would be sold alongside Diablo, which would be presented in 1990. Basically a Yapla replacement. Lamborghini came up with a P140, which was presented in 1988. The same year that the Yapla went out of production. The car was designed by Marcello Gandini and had a lot of similarities with the original Diablo design. To be honest, in my opinion, the P140 looked kind of old for the time. In the late 80s, most of the designers had left the wedged shape designs and the stroke lines, and had started using more refined and softer ones. The power came from a Quattrovalve V10. No matter what, the P140 would have been an amazing car which definitely would have changed the future of Lamborghini. But everything was cancelled due to the big financial troubles that Chrysler was in back in the early 90s, which led to the acquisition of Lamborghini by the Indonesians. Now it's unclear what really happened with Lamborghini under the Indonesian regime, but if they did something right is that they tried to build Kalia. The Lamborghini Cala is essentially what the P140 became. This time Ital Design Giugiaro was hired to do the design. And he made a masterpiece. The car looked very modern and like no other car in the market. But the rear part needs some changes. The interior was very simple and quite similar with other cars that were already in production. Especially with Japanese sport cars. The power came from a 3.9 liter V10 with 400 horsepower, which helps the car to reach 100 in under 5 seconds and to reach a top speed of over 290 km per hour. The Indonesian group really wanted to build this car, but like with the previous concepts, due to the money problems, the project stopped. With the acquisition by Audi in 1998, other projects, including here the Kala and the possible 
LMO2 successor were cancelled. So guys, thank you for watching. See you next time.